Okay, I think we're finally ready to look at refraction of light by a spherical boundary between two different media. And from there, we can stack two of those boundaries together and analyze the thin lens. So for this purpose, I have an industrial strength compass for drawing heavy duty circles because this dinky thing here that you'd normally pick up for school, it, it uh, bends too easily. But this has a, a nut to hold the angle fixed. Allow me to draw <clears throat> an arc of a circle here. This is a little clumsy. No, I'm a little clumsy. All right, I'm obviously an amateur when it comes to using this. I need the pencil to stick out a little farther. All right, that should be su sufficient. Okay, just stab myself, ow. <clears throat> Learn from my mistakes. Oh, it was totally worth the pain. Look at that beautiful arc. I can't tell if this is blood or pencil lead or both. Okay. You need an optical axis. What happened to my pencil? Hang on a second. The magic of video. Here's my optical axis. We'll go with an object point that happens to be on the axis. And you may, you may be thinking, wait a minute, what kind of an object only exists at a single point? Aren't we normally looking at a little fish or a flower or something that's extended? Yeah, but notice there's nothing, uh, because this is a spherical section here, there's nothing special about this axis. If you were talking about a point up here, you could repeat the argument and imagine that your optical axis goes in that direction and it's uh, equivalent. All right, we're gonna look at a single ray emanating from the object point, refracting at the boundary and ending up at some image point over here. Afterwards, we can draw two rays so you get the sense that any rays, any paraxial rays emanating from this point would all converge at the same image point. Now, it's supposed to be a paraxial ray, which means close to the axis, something like this. But if I actually make the angle this small, then the diagram will be cluttered. All of our labels will have to be squeezed into small spaces. So let's make the angle large so that it's easier to visualize everything. And then later, we'll redraw this with an actual paraxial ray. Everything I'm doing is in your book. This is on page 979 of the fourth edition of night. Here's the normal line. And I will extend it all the way back to the axis. Now you may remember from high school geometry that the radius of a circle is perpendicular to the tangent line at this point, which means this normal line that I've drawn actually corresponds to a radius. This would be the radius of the circle. And that would mean that this is the center of curvature of this spherical interface. This could be glass all the way back, and here's air. So this is not actually a, a full sphere or a full circle. It's just a spherical, uh, spherically shaped piece of glass or ice, whatever it is. All right, your book labels this angle alpha. This is the angle between the outgoing ray and the optical axis, and as usual, we'll, we will refer to this angle as theta one. This is the angle of incidence. Let me switch over to a, a pen here. This ray is going to refract. If it's going from air into glass, that's not necessary. It could be any two transparent media, but if it's going from air into glass, the wave will slow down, which means this ray will refract. And evidently I should have drawn this a little longer. 
and I will imagine that it's going to refract um, all the way back to this point here. Can't go any further back than this. Okay, for now, I'll call this point P prime. So the ray leaves the optical axis at P, refracts at the spherical interface, and winds up back on the optical axis at point P prime. And again, the idea is if I drew another ray, used Snell's law to calculate the ref refraction, it would pass through the same point. A third ray used Snell's law, it should pass through the same point. So all the paraxial rays leaving this point are converged to a single point. In other words, this interface is forming an image here of the object point here. What's the appropriate name for this angle? Well, remember this is the normal line and this is the refracted ray. So the angle between them is called theta two. And that, that's already a little crowded. That your book's diagram is a little easier to look at. They call this angle beta, Greek letter beta, alpha and beta. And lastly, they have a name for this angle, the angle that the uh, normal line makes with the optical axis, we call that phi. There's a couple other things that are labeled here as well. If we drop a perpendicular from this point of incidence back down to the optical axis, your book refers to this as T. And there's this rather short distance from the very front of the spherical interface to this point, they call this D. And something you should observe right now is that if this ray were truly par paraxial, close to the, uh, to the axis here, this point of incidence would move down towards this point. And the closer this point gets to this point, the, uh, the shorter D would get. In fact, if you put this point real close to this point, so a ray that, that really is paraxial, D would be practically nothing. Hopefully you can imagine that. Keep that in mind in a moment when we get to our equations. And you will see that there are three right triangles that we can look at here. There's this right triangle. There's this one using the, uh, the normal line, which is the radius of the circle. And then there's this slightly larger right triangle here, um, which has the refracted ray as the hypotenuse. Hey, listen to this. Is that a satisfying sound or what? Diet squirt, aren't you jealous? Thirst quencher. Let's first apply Snell's law to the refraction here. I think I'll write these equations on a separate sheet of paper. And I've labeled the two indices of refraction. We're assuming that N2 is actually greater than N1, which is why I've drawn the refracted ray. Here's the incident ray. The refracted ray has been bent toward the normal. You know, your book probably does a better job because they draw this normal line dot to make it clear that it's the normal line and not the incident ray nor the uh, refracted ray. Snell's law applied to the refraction says N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. And here's where we will use the small angle approximation. Remember, if these are paraxial rays, or if this, if this is a paraxial ray, all of these angles are small. And maybe now is a good time to convince ourselves of that. Flip this over, go back to my industrial strength compass here, slash stabber, try not to injure myself this time. Another beautiful arc there. Optical axis, optical axis, object point P. And this time I'll make a ray that's much more paraxial. I'll sketch the normal line. This time I'll make it dotted. And this ray will be refracted towards the normal.
Let's take a look at the same angles that were labeled on the other side of this page. This is the angle that I was calling theta one. Theta two is this real skinny angle. Alpha was this angle. Beta is this small angle. Phi is this little guy. I think that's all of them. These are definitely all small angles. Remember, the small angle approximation, if I recall, it's, it's valid even as uh, a large as 15 degrees. 15 degrees converted into radians. 15 compared to 180, take that multiple of pi. So that's a, maybe a fun fact to remember that 15 degrees is about one quarter of a radian, 0.26 radians. If I take the tangent of 0.26 radians, uh, I forgot my computer, my calculator needs to be in radian mode. Okay, shift, mode, radian. I'm taking a valuable time here. I'm sorry, let me pause this. Okay, my calculator is now in radian mode. I'm going to take the tangent of 0.26 radians. 0.26. All right, even as high as 15 degrees, fairly accurate. These angles all look less than 15 degrees to me. Okay, these angles, not so much, but the idea is we're talking about uh, paraxial rays like this. And that means we can replace sine of theta one with tangent of theta one or just straight up theta one. Remember that little sketch here of those three functions. Um, this is the function theta. It's, it's, it's like saying y equals x. F of theta is theta or F of theta is sine of theta or F of theta is equal to tangent of theta. Sine, theta, or I should say sine of theta, theta and tangent of theta. They're all very similar in this region. You can replace one with the other. So we go back to this equation and we say that for braxial rays, we can use this very accurate approximation, which is presented in your book. Okay. And now we have to make some observations about the geometry here. And this, this might be the most difficult part. So to see the following relations, you have to remember, as long as you've drawn a triangle on a flat surface, this is not true if you draw a triangle on a sphere, but in the plane, a triangle, uh, one of the rules for triangles is that if you add up all three of these angles, you have to get 180. That's true even if the triangle is not a right triangle. It's true for any triangle. Add up those three angles and you get 180. So we can observe that. Let's see here. Um, would you agree that theta one and this angle right here have to add up to 180? 180 degrees? So theta one is the same as 180 minus this angle. But um, you will also recall, if you're blinded there, you probably caught that. Theta one and this angle have to add up to 180. This whole thing is 180. So this plus theta one is 180. Look at this larger triangle here. Doesn't alpha plus phi plus this angle also have to equal 180? So the sum of alpha and phi is the same as 180 minus this. Alpha plus phi is 180 minus this. But theta one is also 180 minus this which allows us to conclude over here that theta one is the same as alpha plus phi. We're just talking about supplementary angles, two angles that add up to 180 degrees. Let's make a similar observation for theta two now. Focus your attention on this skinny triangle here. This triangle right here. Would you agree that theta two plus beta plus this angle equals 180. Those are the three angles in the triangle that I just traced. So in other words, theta two plus beta is equal to 180 
minus this angle. But we can say the same thing about phi. Phi is also equal to 180 minus this angle. That allows us to conclude that phi is the same as theta 2 plus beta. Theta 2 plus beta has the same value as phi. Let's rewrite this for theta 2. Just subtract beta from both sides, and we can say that theta 2 would be equal to phi minus beta. So we've already written three important relations pertaining to this diagram. Let's continue. Just now we were looking at this big old triangle and this skinny triangle. Now we'll, we'll move on and look at the right triangles that I had originally traced. This one, this one, and lastly, the one with the refracted ray as the hypotenuse. Okay. Let's deal with the tangent function. Um, what's the tangent of alpha? Opposite over adjacent. Okay, well, there's a couple more labels we need in this diagram. The distance between the object and the very front of the, the spherical boundary here, that's called the object distance. We've used this letter already. That's S. Okay, so the adjacent side of this triangle would actually be S plus D. Opposite over adjacent, we've got this fact. The tangent of alpha is equal to T over object distance plus D. That's just the tangent function applied to this right triangle. Let's look at beta now. See this, this larger right triangle? If we're talking about beta, the opposite side would be T. The adjacent side would be this distance. Well, how can we express that? Because we don't actually have a label for this distance. Let's use the letter S prime again for image distance. That's the distance between the image point, P prime, and the front of the spherical boundary. The adjacent side of the triangle in question would be S prime minus this little bit. So the tangent of beta would be T over S prime minus D. So they have the same opposite side in common. That's, this letter T shows up for both right triangles. The last angle we're going to need is phi. Let's look at this smaller right triangle. Tangent of phi would be this opposite side over, okay, what do we do now? Well, what's the distance from the center of curvature to the front here? That's just the radius of the circle. So if we take the radius of the circle and subtract off this little quantity d, we will have the adjacent side of this right triangle. The tangent of phi should be T over R minus D. Well, what do we do next? I think we invoke the small angle approximation again. Keep in mind that tangent of an angle is practically equal to that angle as long as we're talking about small angles. We are talking about small angles as, I hope you were convinced by this diagram, all of these angles are small because the ray is paraxial. So, Instead of tangent of alpha, I could just call that alpha. That's beta and that's phi. See if I can put this all together in one step. Before I do that, let's ask ourselves, what are we even trying to do here? What's the objective with this diagram? Well, we'd like to be able to predict where the image point is going to be. How far out from the front here will the image point P prime be in terms of the object distance and perhaps the radius, radius of curvature, and of course also the indices of refraction. All of those should show up in the formula. So what I will do is I could take this expression for theta one, plug that in here, and then I can take this expression for theta two and plug that in here, and rather than write that out, I will immediately substitute in all these expressions for alpha, beta, and phi. I'll plug those in anytime I see them here. And here's the equation I get, n1 times theta1. Well, theta1 is this, theta1 is all this, but alpha is that, and phi is this. So I've got t over s plus d plus, and then instead of phi, I will write 
this expression, t over r minus d, and that's got to equal n2, that's a really long number one there, and then now I'm gonna write phi two. Well, phi two is all, excuse me, theta two. Theta two is all this garbage. Phi is the same as this, t over r minus d minus, and instead of beta, I will write this expression. Okay, well, this is looking kind of gnarly and it's got some quantities that we're actually not interested in, namely t, is that it? Also d. What can we do to get rid of those? Well, since t is in each term throughout the equation, we could just divide the whole equation by t. Great. If I divide the whole thing by t, these would all turn into ones. That's one little step in the algebra. But we'd also like to get rid of d. Remember, remember that comment I made a few minutes ago about how for a truly paraxial ray, this quantity d becomes very small. t doesn't necessarily become too small but D would be very small. Can we see that on this diagram? Yeah, in fact, T would be this distance, not zero. I mean, it's small, smaller than it was before, but it's not zero. D is this tiny little distance here. For a truly paraxial ray, D is practically zero. So I will say, divide by t and then d goes to zero for a paraxial ray and now we can rewrite this equation here t's are gone d's are gone we've got n1 over s so i'm distributing n1 to both of these terms plus n1 over r equals on the right side, again, the T is turned into a one, D is gone, N2 over R minus N2 over S prime. Can we simplify this just a bit? I think we can because these two terms have a common denominator. Let's take this, move it over to the left side. N1 over object distance plus N2 over image distance equals, I'll factor out, a one over R, and then write this as N2 minus N1. Okay, we can call this image formation by a spherical bounder, boundary <coughs> between two media. I'll just leave that part off, but it's, it's a spherical boundary between two mediums, media with possibly different indices of refraction. Of course, both media need to be transparent. They have to allow light to pass through them. You'll find this formula in your book. This is, again, this is on page 979. It's not that hard to memorize. You know, I forget it a semester after we've uh, gone over this material, but notice the object distance is on the left side of the boundary where the index of refraction is N1. The image distance, at least for our diagram, was on the other side of the boundary where the index of refraction is N2. So that helps you remember uh, how to match these up. I should point out though, that the, um, the scenario doesn't have to be this. It doesn't have to be air and glass. In fact, it's not even necessary that this index of refraction be greater than this. This could actually be the glass over here. And over here could be air, in which case, this ray would have been away from the normal. And it's, it's a remarkable fact that the equation here is valid even for that scenario. It's also valid even if this spherical interface faces the other way. So if you're looking from this direction, this is the object point. You would say that this is convex towards the object point. Convex towards the object point. If it was scooped out like this, you would say it's concave towards the object point. Even if it's concave, you could still use this formula with one correction. You would have to consider the radius of curvature to be a negative number. Now you may have trouble remembering all these things. Don't worry, there's a table in your book. Table 34.2, you should be reading this anyway. 
which will give you the sign conventions for rays refracting at a spherical interface. You might even want to throw this on a, on a note card for an exam, because it can be a little tricky to keep all this stuff straight. Okay, the next thing to do would be to stack two of these boundaries up next to each other, and we call that a lens. So we're, we're almost done with this chapter. We're almost to the, uh, the most important formula from, from the chapter, which would be the thin lens equation, and arguably also the lens maker's equation. We're practically there.